What's up, everybody, and welcome in to another edition of the sit down. As always, if you enjoy this video, please make sure you hit that like button. Let me know what you think of today's very interesting discussion in the comment section below. If you're new around here, you just haven't done it yet, or you're living under a rock and seeing this video for the first time, I don't know what you're waiting for. Hit that subscribe button below now so you never miss another sit down video. What's up, everybody? Welcome in. It is Thanksgiving week. I am your host, Jeff Nadeau. This is episode 186 of the sit down. Before we delve into the football, turkey, and family time, we got another great episode planned for you today, as always. So stay tuned for that in just a second. Before we get to that, though, I do want to shout out a pal of mine who had a milestone recently. My good friend RJ Roger released his book finally. The Don, 36 Rules of the Bosses. It is a Yoast Alfers book, and I think it's going to be a bestseller. I urge you to go check out this book now. I've read it. It's a great book. It's something that every person that's interested in mob history or this journey on YouTube needs to check out. If you want to check it out, I included the link in the pinned comment of the video. If you're listening to us on iTunes, Appreciate you as always as well. I included the link in the description of the audio also. So go check that out right now. Let's get into our episode today. As always, you know, there's very little preamble here on this show. And Sonny Franzese is the oldest mobster of all time. He would live to age 103. And at the time of his death, he was the oldest living American mobster on the planet. He's gone, though, now, and there's someone that has taken over that mantle as the oldest living mobster currently in America. And he's someone you probably haven't heard of. The story of Lawrence Little Larry Dentico, the oldest living mobster in America. Next on the sit down, Lawrence Dentico was born way back on August 22nd, 1923 in new york city understand what i just said he is living and he was born in 1923 which would make him 101 years old pretty unbelievable the stories little larry might have lawrence dentigo would grow up according to the 1930 census in east harlem his family lived at 437 East 119th Street, not far from First Avenue in East Harlem. As we know, in those days, in the 20s and 30s, East Harlem was really the center of Little Italy in New York. Little Italy was around, but the real Little Italy was in East Harlem. In fact, at one point, East Harlem was called Italian Harlem. There were so many mobsters there. In fact, when we look at the early tentacles of the New York Five Families, they were in Manhattan. A lot of it was in East Harlem. You look at really when we're talking about the Genovese crime family, which we're talking about today in Dentico, their tentacles still today are in East Harlem. You know, we know that people like fat Tony Salerno came up in Harlem. So many people from Lucchese and Genovese crime families came up in East Harlem and a lot of their roots are based there. Now, as far as Dentico's father, Frank, he was listed in that 1930 census as a salesman. He would have, obviously, a wife and two sons, one of which was Lawrence Dentico. The other was Anthony Dentico. Now, over the years, if you know anything about Lawrence Dentico and if you have looked into his past, there is inaccurate information that said that he had a brother called Joseph. There was a Joseph Dentico, and he was associated with the mafia, and this is what he looks like. As far as I know, though, that was Lawrence Dentico's uncle. From what I know, Joseph Dentico had two brothers, one of which was called Frank. That was Lawrence Dentico's uncle, Joe Dentico. Now, Joe Dentico was born in 1898, which would make it very unlikely that he was Lawrence Dentico's brother. It was actually his uncle. Dentico's father. Frank Dentico was related to Joe. So it was uncle. Now, Joe Dentico is kind of an interesting person in his own right. He was actually naturalized in America in 1923 and was involved in 
jukebox rackets and was an early narcotics trafficker, according to uh, mafia membership charts.blogspot.com. And in fact, he was arrested by the Federal Bureau of Narcotics um, and convicted down the road. Um, it would, at one point, he would go to California to work in a drug ring. Um, and he pretty much disappeared after uh, his release from prison on that 1942 charge. So we would have to think he probably went out to California and just stayed there. But there is some connection to the mob in Lawrence Dentico's family. Uh, but as far as we know, his father was not involved in the life. Um, in February of 1943, at the age of just 17, or not 17, 19, Lawrence Dentico would be conscripted to the military. Now, as far as I know through records, I don't believe Lawrence Dentico ever saw battle. It was a lot of movement around bases from Tennessee to Idaho to places like that. I don't believe he ever saw action in World War II, but like many as a 17 to 20 year old kid, he was conscripted to fight. Luckily for him, I don't believe he saw any action. Now, by the late 40s, Dentico would come home and head to the streets of East Harlem. In the 1950 census, Dentico was listed as an inmate at a city prison uh, for selling dope. Uh, so back then, the census was a pretty important thing. Um, and they actually took a census of the prison. And at the New York City prison, there was a document where he was listed as an inmate at that time. And as far as I know, in the early 50s and late 40s, Dentico took two narcotics charges. So, you know, again, we do know down the road that Dentica will be associated with Vito Genovese. Uh, so it is likely that in those days, a lot of people uh, move narcotics and we won't hold that against them. Now, I want to talk about his involvement in getting into organized crime, Lawrence Dentico, because he really was involved with some crazy people. At one point, Dentico was a member of a group called the Jets, and that was headed by a person called John Earl, uh, and we thank Gangland News for this rare photo. Johnny Earl at one point was called one of the toughest people, George Barone, who was a member of the Jets as well, had ever come across. In fact, a lot of people believe that one of Vito Genovese's chief hitters was Johnny Earl. Uh, in fact, it was said many times that Vito Genovese would stake Johnny Earl and his Irish gang with uh, money to put out in the street and they were able to operate as long as johnny earl did what he had to do when Vito genovese asked if you've ever heard anything about johnny earl he was a very very uh feared individual on uh, the upper west side uh hell's kitchen um a lot of the irish neighborhoods and he ran around with some pretty crazy people including a man called elmer trigger burke now trigger burke in the late 50s was ultimately uh, given the death penalty in Sing Sing. Uh, he was a very accomplished uh, shooter. Uh, he was involved in uh, the war at one point. Uh, he was a very uh, skilled marksman and Trigger Burke was a criminal. He was part of the Jets. And what's interesting is in 1956, Lawrence Dentica was actually arrested in Greenwich Village um, and saw it as a witness or involved in a large bank robbery alongside Trigger Burke. So these guys in the Jets, Johnny Earl, Trigger Burke, um, George Barone, um, all these guys under Earl were committing bank robberies. They were making things difficult. They were extorting people. And they were working as kind of a faction under Vito Genovese. And when people needed to go, Johnny Earl was called. Now, eventually, I think certain people in the Jets became a little disillusioned with Johnny Earl. Some of the Italian guys, like Larry Dentico, would start kind of moving around in Greenwich Village circles with mob guys. And eventually, Johnny Earl became too much of a liability. He became very greedy. And we would learn from longtime Bonanno and Genovese hitter Harold K.O. Koningsberg that. There was a plot that was divulged in the early 60s. Koningsberg would say that he was essentially involved in a plot with nearly a dozen mostly dead cohorts now, which back in the 60s, we're talking about people like Chin Giganti, 
Larry Dentigo, uh, Tony Benderstralo, Tommy Aboli, and had to get the okay to kill Johnny Earl from G Vito Genovese. In fact, Kale Koningsberg claims that he was at the diner and witnessed Mr. Earl at a phone booth and he saw him get, get taken out. So it is believed that Dentico and other, you know, people in the Genovese crime family moved to get the approval to whack Johnny Earl, take over all his spoils and get him out of the way. And it was said that it was likely that Vito Genovese from prison had to approve that piece of work. It was said Dentigo was likely made in the late 50s before the books closed. And we would also find that as of 1964, the leader of the Greenwich Village crew, which Dentigo was involved in, was Patsy Ryan Eboli. Because remember, in 1962, Tony Bender is taken out. Tommy Eboli is locked up. Patsy Ryan takes over. Other members of the Greenwich Village crew at that time were Little Larry Dentico, Mario, and Chin Giganti, as well as Bobby Manna, Dom the Sailor de Quarto, and Joseph Pagano. They were one of the strongest crews in the city. That Greenwich Village crew in the early to mid 60s, very formidable. And all of the people I just mentioned became hierarchy people in the family dentico and uh mana became high ups chin became the boss for a period of time mario sat on committees joe pagano was a higher up at one point he had essentially taken over rockland county um all very powerful people um and dentico by the mid 60s was very powerful i mean he was someone who it was said 30 years later that shin giganti loved he was a big fan of little larry and I think Chin obviously realized by the mid to late 60s, and we know this, after Ebelies are out of the way, Philly, uh, Benny the Squint Lombardo goes away, we obviously see the early tentacles that Chin's going to be a higher up at some point, and his Greenwich Village crew by that point, because we know Chin takes over that group, all of the people that were close to him, the, ben, the Benny uh, Eggs, the Denticos, the Bobby Manas, we're all going to have our kind of piece of the pie and what chin does is i think it's kind of instructed that he sends mana and dentigo and they take over all of north jersey which they do we see the genovese crime family faction in jersey take over the ports take over construction take over bookmaking loan sharking extortion and we see that by dentico's arrest record because in 1966 he's pinched for extortion and he faces other charges down the road, too, pertaining to his involvement with various rackets. Now, sadly for Larry Dentico, in 1969, he would get some bad news. According to newspaper obituaries, Larry Dentico's father, Frank Dentico, would die in 1969. That said, Dentico, by this point, very involved in New Jersey. He's working out of um, you know, the Hoboken, Bloomfield, those types of areas, um, and actually has residences in New Jersey as well. And he makes trips between New York and Manhattan and those areas. One thing, though, that pops up by the early 80s is Dentico is very involved in construction projects, uh, most notably federally funded construction projects. He starts getting into um, you know, bid rigging and he's rigging bids for companies that he owns. He's getting people to rid bid, rid bids, rig bids, rid big, rig bids. And one of the people involved in this is the mayor of Union, New Jersey, Union City, New Jersey, a man called William Musto. All of these people are involved in um bid rigging and eventually a uh, racketeering. Uh, down the road, Musto. Uh, is jammed up, Dentigo's jammed up, school board presidents are jammed up, all sorts of people are jammed up in rigging bids for construction projects that are federally funded, and they're making a ton of money, which is going back to the Genovese crime family. We know how this works. Dentigo in 1982 um, is convicted of this case, and 
it wouldn't be until 1984 he was actually sentenced. He would get 10 years. That said, just two months before Dentico reports to prison in July of 1984, he is seen on surveillance in the late hours uh, of, of the evening meeting with, guess who, Chin Giganti in the Lower East Side in Greenwich Village. So again, by this point, Dentico is very well thought of in this family. And as we know, with the mob, really anything you do, connections mean everything. And Chin Giganti was in control of this family for 30 plus years. You know that all of the guys that were around him since the beginning in the 60s, when Chin was just part of the crews, right? Part of Vito Genovese's crew, the Greenwich Village group, all of the people that rose in this family and became hierarchy positions down the road when been with Chin since the beginning. His brother Mario, Bobby Manna, Benny Eggs, Larry Dentico. It's all simple to understand how this works out. It's really so interesting when you look at how these families construct because they're all from similar situations. They're all from similar areas, and they all kind of meld together, and they're very loyal to each other. That's one thing about... Uh, certain people, they're all very loyal to each other. Now, if somebody does something stupid, they're going to get killed. But all these people took care of each other. So Dentico heads off to prison in 1984, and he would remain there um, through the commission case, uh, the John Gotti Castellano stuff, um, you know, even John Gotti's conviction. So he'd be off the street for all that stuff um, and would come home in the early to mid nineties, uh, Dentico came back to a much different city. Um, obviously Gotti's out of the way. He's in prison. Chin's fighting for his life because his whole ruse has been figured out. And Dentico cashes in because by this point, the dainty Dentico, and I don't want to call him dainty. I, I guess small is more the word. Um, he is thought of as a higher up at this point. Now, I want to go to a very interesting conversation that was recorded uh, involving this guy, Salvatore Sammy Meatballs Aparo. Now, Sammy Meatballs was a uh, captain. He was out of uh, where, you know, Manhattan, Brooklyn. He was hanging out with Joe Zito, those guys. I did a show on Joe recently. And in 1999, the FBI secretly recorded Sammy Meatballs describing kind of how involved not only Larry Dentico was in the running of the family, but also how Danny Leo was involved too. What, what we have to realize is by the mid to late nineties, Chin Giganti was fighting for his life. So what we start seeing is these committees that are popping up and they're handling all the business of the family, everything from making new members to handling business, to handling the money, to handling the people, the captains. There's committees that are popping up. And in those committees, we're seeing Larry Dentico, Mario Giganti, Quiet Dom Cirillo, Danny Leo, Johnny Sausage Barbato. All of these people are acting in some higher position with the family. And Sammy Meatballs, in his wiretap conversation, discusses that. Aparo states, quote, Larry, Danny, and Ernie, referring to Muscarella, who was also involved on the hierarchy, quote, conducted the induction. Danny was the individual who pricked the finger and told him what to say during the ceremony, according to an FBI summary of the tape recorded conversation. So Dentico is doing ceremonies, Ernie Muscarella, Danny Leo. In fact, I talked to Anthony Arrelot and he told me that he knew Dentico very well. And Dentico was thought of as a high ranking figure in New York at that time. He was on the committee, according to Anthony Arrelotta, who was made by the Genovese crime family in the late nineties. So Dentico is very well thought of getting out of prison. Remember, I mean, he's pretty old at this point, but all of these people are, but they're all still very powerful. Now we would also hear a wiretap conversation uh, involving this guy, Alan Longo, who was also a captain in the early 2000s. A year later, in October 2000, 
Longo glowingly described Larry Dentico and Danny Leo as, quote, close associates of Giganti who are, quote, running the family. Also in that conversation, Longo would state, quote, you got Danny Leo, you got Larry, a few other guys. That guy, referring to Chin, loves them. They're gentlemen. They got money. They're men and a half. Now that's Alan Longo, a captain, talking about Danny Leo and little Larry Dentico. And when he refers to that guy, he's never going to say Chin. He's going to say that guy. So the, the guy, the guy in prison, he can't operate, but these guys are operating for him. Very well respected. Now, Dentico was on the committee of the family from approximately 1996 to 2004. However, in and around that time, he is indicted alongside various other members and associates, um, including Michael Borelli, who's seen with the cast on. Borelli was a family member based out of New Jersey and part of Dentico, Dentico's tentacles at one point. Now, little Larry Dentico... Um, is indicted for essentially racketeering, gambling, bookmaking, extortion. Also indicted in a similar case is Quiet Dom Cirillo. Johnny Sausage Barbato is indicted as well as, as Anthony Antico, another higher up in the Genovese crime family. Ultimately, Dentico decides that you know everything against him is probably pretty bad for him and decides to plead guilty. However, in 2005, when he pleads guilty, Dentico says, quote, that he was not admitting to being a member of anything. He just admitted to the charges. Very cagey. I'm not going to acknowledge I'm part of what you say is this group. I'm not a part of that group, but I did do certain things, and I'm pleading guilty to that. I'm not pleading guilty to being a member. This is a person who, remember, in 2005 is... In his early 80s, he had been around the mafia for decades. He had made a higher ranking position in the most powerful crime family in the country. And he was there in the forefront of Vito Genovese and Giganti. I mean, just unbelievable life and never admitted to anything. I don't know what that is. I never heard of the mafia. I don't know what that is. And we've seen that so many times, not only in this country, but in Italy. And I, I saw John Panisi did a pretty interesting video about that recently, about how there's two types of mob guys. There are guys who will admit they're part of something and allocute, which all of the people we're talking about here, Dantigo would call that a rap move, 100%. You never admit to the existence of this thing. And this is how far we've come in a negative light. Not we, but this life has come. There are people that are on YouTube right now and, and in the circle that they'll say that a person that talks to the police is not a rat as long as she doesn't put anyone in prison. No, no, no. That's not how it works. If you are a member of the mafia and you speak to the police under any circumstance, hey, how you doing? Hope your wife's good. That's a rat move to them. I don't care. I'm not in that life. But think about what I just said. Dentico admitted that he did gambling or whatever he pled guilty to. But I'm not part of anything. That's a gangster right there. Very few people like this still alive. And, and you know, again, people like Dom Cirillo, do you actually think they would ever admit to doing anything? And what I do find a bit ridiculous is Dominic Sicali, who has a YouTube channel, we've interviewed him, is dedicating a book to Dom Cirillo? What do you think Dom Cirillo would do with that book if he ever got his hands on it? The Dom's dead now. But have a little, like, self-awareness. Like, you knew the guy, cool, but, like, what do you think he would think of you? I'm getting off on a tangent. In the end, Larry Dentico would be sentenced to 51 months in federal prison, he would be released in May of 2009 at the age of 85. Since 2009, we have not heard from Dentico. Dentico is not seen. He's not been at meetings. 
He's not been on surveillance. He's 101 years old. My guess is since he got out of prison, he's probably just retired at this point, and he will always be a member of the mafia, but he's not out there doing stuff. Do I think it's crazy to think that maybe a kid, you know, somebody in his 30s or 40s, you know, drops off an envelope to him once in a while? Probably not. I mean, does he have businesses that are legit that he still makes money off of? Probably. I don't think Dentico has any issues with money. He's made a bunch of it over his career. Um, but this is the unique case of mobsters who are over the age of 90 and where are they actually in the hierarchy of the family. And my thought is, I think once you get to a certain point, the 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 guys that are in the control of the family now, the, the Barneys, the Falsettis, the you know people like that. I think they view people like Dentico as just a, a legend, essentially. And I, let me just say this: I don't think the hierarchy of the Genovese crime family right now is banging down Dentico's door to hand an envelope in. I think they're probably taking care of him if they can. Like in a subsistence way. And I'm sure he has plenty of businesses too. This is a really unique case. Do I think Denta goes out there at 101 shaking down strip clubs like John Franzese was late in his life? Of course not. Um, Dentico literally lives with the true thought that he's 101 years old. He's outlived probably every person that watches this video will never get to 101 years old. Very few people get to 95, let alone 101. Dentico has possibly the most interesting life in the history of life. And what's so sad, but also so respectable is I could knock on Larry Dentico's door right now and offer him a hundred million dollars to talk to me. And he wouldn't say a fucking word. He would close the door and tell me to leave. He'd probably be very respectful about it, but he would tell me to leave. And that's something that they just don't make anymore. Now, I do think it's sad in a way because there are so many people that we will never hear from. You know, if you're a, a chef, you share your secrets as you get older. You know, if you're Ralph Lauren or Calvin Klein, you talk about your life. Hey, this is what I did. This is how I did it. The biggest sadness that I have in doing what we do here on Mafia Tube is that so many stories are never told to us. I think it's sad you have to listen to me tell you these stories. Do you know how cool it would be if we could just get these stories told to us by these people? So in a way, we kind of need people like me because very few people are telling these stories, if anybody, outside of me and one or two others. Now, before I go, I want to talk a little bit about a tentacle of the Dentico family. Back in 2015, this individual, Lawrence A. Dentico, was arrested uh, in a large weed ring based out of New York with connections to Gambino captain and current consigliere Michael Paradiso. Now, when I did the video on Michael Paradiso that could be seen here, um, I um, I referenced Dentico. Um, and I want to read kind of what he's involved in because from what I understand, he was arrested just over a year ago um, involved with the same stuff. In and around the mid-2010s, Mr. Dentico moves to La Jolla, California, um, and he was involved with narcotics, as far as we know. Following an indictment involving a person called Richard Sinde, who was a banana associate on a separate criminal matter in 2015, Sinde was involved in a, a ring that was trafficking weed into New York. Following that indictment, according to what we know, Larry Dentico, grandson of Genevieve's heavyweight, little Larry Dentico, assumed a greater responsibility for working with a person called John Kelly and coordinating the shipping and distribution of weed from California, where Dentico resided and oversaw farming operations, to New York. Kelly's wife, a person called Zana DeMorney, also assisted her husband by funneling the proceeds of the scheme from New York to California to the use of fictitious corporations, one of which being called 
Regional Food Brokers Incorporated. Now, in total, the weed distribution scheme allegedly generated more than $15 million in illegal revenue based on average proceeds of $350,000 a month over a 21-month period. So this Dentico moves out to California. He's probably like a pothead. He starts involving himself in growing weed at a farm in wherever the hell it is in California. He has connections back to New York, and he says, hey, we'll do the old George Young thing. I'll package this shit. We'll get it over to you, and you move it on the streets. They're making a bunch of money. Dentico's jammed up. I also know that back in 2021, November of 2021, California Highway Patrol would find more than $400,000 in suspected uh, narcotic money during a Fresno County traffic stop. One of the people arrested that day was a Lawrence Albert Dentico of La Jolla, California. So uh, Mr. Dentico is, you know, making some money. We're not going to call him a bad person because he's selling weed. Who hasn't done that? Um, and it's pretty legal around the country. But just an interesting tentacle uh, in this kind of sphere we're talking about today. Um, I spent a lot of time on this video. I'm like fascinated by Dentico. I think he's like one of the true gangsters uh, out there. I mean, could you imagine just sitting, you know, for an hour or two in a room having a cup of coffee with Dentico? Like, and, and, and obviously there would be a rule where nothing he said could ever leave, but I would love to just sit there and listen to him talk. I mean, it's, God, it's fascinating. I, I just, it's fucking sad that we'll never get to hear it. But that's the mafia for you. It is what it is. I hope you enjoyed this episode as always. Um, Larry Dentico, the oldest living mobster. And a lot of people had trouble. They didn't know who I was going to talk about. There's a guy, Mario Fiore. He's 100 years old. He's still living. He's a guy from Connecticut, connected to the Genovese family. You know, in fact, um, the Genovese crime family, a lot of old members. I mean, Bobby Manna. Um, Ga uh, Kid Blast Gallo. Um, there's all sorts of you know all sorts of old guys that are still involved with the with the life. I mean, uh, Quiet Dom lived pretty pretty late into his life, and it was mid 90s. Um, these all these guys all have pretty good genes if we we're giving them some sort of credit. Uh, but that's that on Larry Dentico. Before we go, I want to wish all of you a very happy Thanksgiving. Uh, whether you're on audio or video, I hope you enjoy the time with your family, your loved ones. I hope you have a great meal and. I hope you uh, come back here uh, as we always do and check out our co content. It's, uh, it's been fun doing all this. So uh, enjoy your holiday. Enjoy your Black Friday if I don't talk to you. We'll see you next week here on The Sit Down.